Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to look at your word and again to observe this prayer that you have given us, what we call the Lord's Prayer, that has given us a model to know how to pray. So, Father God, as we continue this series, I pray, Lord, that you continue to impress the words on our mind, what its meaning is, and, Lord, how we can apply it more effectively to our lives and to our prayer lives as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a controversy. Controversy. We got a controversy in today's message, but let's read our passage first. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. So, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 15, and that can be located on page 685 inside your Pew Bible, so if you want to follow along in there. We're going to start in verse. 9, read through 15, Matthew chapter 6, 685 in your pew Bibles. <clears throat> it reads, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Controversy. Controversy. So what, what is the controversy that we are talking about within this line of text? Within the Lord's Prayer itself, how is it that we come across controversy inside of the prayer that Jesus Christ himself taught us uh, I, I think that we like controversy. Uh, and the one we've talked about is actually an age-old controversy. Some of you might already know what I'm talking about before I even mention it. But I think that controversy, the reason why we like it is it excites us, uh, excites our senses, makes us think, and brings us into a deeper conversation about things. But I think the real reason why we all really like controversy is that it's all like gossip. A bunch of sinners or debtors, or transgressors, or trespassers. I think the Lord's Prayer says something about that, doesn't it? Something about those word, those different words, debtors, sinners. Let me see here. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Uh, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses, says we forgive those who trespass against us. Ah! I think I found the controversy within this text right here. Uh, what is the controversy, you might be asking? Well, all you have to do is pick up your bulletin, and when you read the Lord's Prayer within our bulletin, we see a big difference from the way that we traditionally hear the Lord's Prayer being said versus how we have it printed. We didn't just see it within our bulletin, but also uh, within uh, this particular version of the Bible. Uh we say debt and debtors, and yet we hear hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of Christians saying trespasses when they're reciting the Lord's Prayer. What's going on here? And why is, why is there such a big disagreement regarding this one word and how we are to recite the Lord's Prayer? I remember years back, uh, one of my friends from college had purchased a book written by one, you'll probably be familiar with this person, Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert, are you all familiar? Most of you, some of you are familiar with Stephen Colbert. He's, he's a comedian. Uh, and my friend shared certain excerpts from this book with me. And I believe the name of the book was I'm America and So Can You. Uh, and uh, he has a Catholic background. And so he was talking about certain things of his growing up in faith. And this particular section was on the Lord's Prayer. And he, and what wasn't specifically on the Lord's Prayer, it was about denominations and their different beliefs and all that. And uh, he made it to Protestantism versus Catholicism. And he said, you know, uh, debts and transgressions, you know, wars have been fought over this one word. And he was joking about it. But in the same, in the same respect, for some, this is actually a very serious issue. Do we say trespasses or do we say debts? I'm glad to say, at least my understanding of the congregation, I don't think that that's a big controversy inside of our particular church. 
We have our preference. Otherwise, we would not have debts and debtors inside of the Lord's Prayer with how it's printed inside of our bulletin. Uh, and I, I don't think that any one of us would be willing to go to war or even like change denominations because of the fact that we prefer one word to another. Having said that, truth is important, right? And getting it right is important. And we are dealing with a matter of God's word. So, debts, debtors, whatever word, we are going to finish this issue, solve it, once and for all, today, in about 15 minutes, okay? Uh, so, I knew that I was eventually going to get to this particular passage. I knew that we are going to be talking about debts and trespasses. And actually, to tell the truth, it has been a question of mine, uh, even since I started going to this church, because um, uh, traditionally, I've always said trespasses within the Lord's Prayer. Um, but I remember all the way back to seminary, uh, all the way back to seminary that I had a professor who, when going over the Lord's Prayer, as he shared it with us, that he said that he thinks the word most appropriate uh, with how it's translated uh, in this instance, as we pray, should actually be the word sin. And so my family and I, my wife and I, my kids and I, when we uh, say the Lord's Prayer at night, we say the Lord's Prayer every night. Uh, that we actually say the word sin when we are reciting uh, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but here's a question. Was my professor right? Was it really sin? Well, today I think it's going to be challenging for all of us uh, because uh, I thought this would be an open and shut case. Well, as I studied it more, I'll let you make the determination regarding whether it's an open shut case, whether we can make a definitive conclusion regarding what word we should use inside of the Lord's Prayer. Debt, trespass, sin. Those are the three options that we have right now. You might even be able to come up with some other ones. I don't know. There might be some other options that I'm unaware of. Uh, regarding open and shut cases, the quickest way to resolve an issue like this is to go back to the original language, right? That'd be the simplest, most reasonable, logical way to find out what word do we use in a particular instance. And uh, when I did the research in it, the word, uh, you go to Matthew 6.12, that's where it is, and we look up the original Greek, the original Greek word for the word in that instance is ophelates, okay? Ophelates. Here is the moment of truth. Am I going to end the sermon right now, maybe with just one word? What does ophelates mean? Do we get a drum roll? Anybody want to give me a drum roll? There it is. We got a drum roll going. This is great. It means debts. I was so disappointed. But I wasn't too surprised because as I was doing my research, I was going through the different translations of the Bible, and I saw from one to the other to the other to the other. In this passage, the word debts is used in all these modern translations, and it blew me away. And I was, uh, I was expecting something totally different in the Greek. So why on earth would anyone suggest that it could be trespass, or in my case, sin? Well, this is where it starts to get interesting. Because Matthew 6 is not the only chapter in the Bible containing the Lord's Prayer. Turn with me now to Luke chapter 11. Luke 11, verses 2 through 4. So Luke 11, 2 through 4. <clears throat> Read, Father, how would be your name, your kingdom come, Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our, what? Sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Wow. Now we got a problem. Now we got a controversy. And guess what? I looked up the word, in this case for sins, and it was exactly the word that I expected to see in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. 
It's the word hamar. Ham, ham, sorry, I, I normally can just roll right off the top of my tongue when you're in front of people. You mess things up. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> hamar, hamartias. Hamartias. Greek word hamartias. And the word literally translates into the word sin. Okay, so we got this big controversy because this is essentially the same prayer in two parts of Scripture, but now we are reading two different things. What's going on? Hey, are you ready for it? Are you ready for what's going on here? Although Jesus probably did speak Greek, Koine Greek to be precise, in this context, he would have been speaking his own native language. What was Jesus' native language? Aramaic. Aramaic. Well, what did he say in Aramaic? We actually don't know. I'm sure that many people can speculate and guess and throw out their best answers for what word Jesus may have used in Aramaic. Well, the biblical writers probably knew. And in fact, when translating it from Aramaic to Greek, Matthew, when he heard Jesus speak the word and he was trying to figure out like, okay, well, how do we translate this into Koine Greek so we can share with the world? And he probably said, you know what? I think that maybe the best translation for the word that Jesus used in this instance is debt. Now think about this. What was Matthew? He was a tax collector. So it made sense to him that, okay, something's owed. So therefore we say debt. So forgives our debts. And mind you, yes, I'm translating it into English. Forgives our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then one of the apostles probably shared this with Luke. And while Luke was translating it into Greek, he probably thought to himself, well, you know, I think that the best word for my understanding the gospel and what our problem is in this instance is probably the word sin. Okay? So isn't the same spirit, though, guiding them both? I mean, isn't the Holy Spirit, isn't that what we believe? The Holy Spirit guides us all, and he's guiding the people that wrote the Bible, so there shouldn't be any difference whatsoever from passage to passage when we're reading a similar event. Can the Holy Spirit contradict himself? And would he not lead them in the same direction as one another? Well, here's the thing. He most certainly was leading them in the same direction while using their own personalities to give us a complete understanding of this word in the Lord's Prayer. So by looking at the two, we can see that they give us a complementary understanding of what Jesus was saying in the Lord's Prayer. Our true problem that we need forgiven of and others do as well is sin. And inherently within our sin, we are placed into spiritual debt with God and with others. Which is why forgiveness is so important. Which leads me to one final word, and don't worry, I wasn't going to leave it out. What about trespasses? Isn't that what the majority of Christians say around the world when you hear them reciting the Lord's Prayer? They say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who would trespass against us? It's not found in either version of the Lord's Prayer. So where do we get this from? Well, let me put your spirit at ease. If you're a trespasses person, if you're a trespasser, does that sound good, trespasser? If you're a trespasser, um, let me put your spirit at ease. Because I found it. I found trespasses. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Did you notice how like we've been reading through the Lord's Prayer, studying the Lord's Prayer, and we always include these two little verses at the end that we don't recite in the Lord's Prayer because it's actually not part of the Lord's Prayer per se. Verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they, say, when they, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. What's fascinating here, we don't have hamartia right here as the Greek word. We have a new word that's introduced in the Greek language. It's paraptoma. Paraptoma. And when I looked up the meaning for this word, and this is what Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible says, 
It defines it as a side slip, error, or transgression, fall, fault, offense, sin, and another drum roll. <laughs> Just kidding. Here you go. Trespass. All right? So don't you feel so much better now? We got trespasses in there as well. And mind you, verses 14 and 15, 15 are totally related to the Lord's Prayer. They provide commentary on the importance of forgiving other people and how that is directly related to God forgiving us. And that is the true takeaway from this portion of Scripture. I don't think it's wrong for us to get tied up in proper biblical translation. This is, after all, like I said before, God's Word. It should be translated in a very specific way to help us to understand what the authors were intending to say based on the original languages. But having said that, we need to keep in mind that the English is a translation of the original manuscripts. And for apologetical purposes, we need to keep in mind that Jesus himself was probably not speaking Greek most of the time, which was why we needed the apostles to communicate the message of Jesus to the rest of the world. And the Holy Spirit led them and how to get it right. And we can trust fully that the words that we have inside of our Bible today, after having done the research, I guarantee it, we can trust that they are indeed God's word preserved from thousands of years ago. So now that we got that all out of the way, what is this portion of the Lord's Prayer revealing to us? What's our application, so to speak? Well, for one, it's telling us another very important component of our prayer life, confession and repentance. And you can find examples of this throughout the Bible that we are to pray that God forgives us of our sins. Another important component of this that Protestant evangelicals are not so good at, I would say, is confessing sins to one another. We see this command very specifically written in James 5, 16. But that's a different topic for a different day. We're not going to get into that exactly. Second, we learn <clears throat> that we are to forgive other people of their sins against us. We are to ask God when we are praying to forgive us our sins as we forgive others of their offenses against us. And the fact that the commentary following the Lord's Prayer, and this commentary is not like some commentary by some guy somewhere. This is actually the words of Jesus himself following the Lord's Prayer. The fact that he's given this commentary uh, that we should forgive each other as God forgives us um, should inform us how seriously Jesus took this component of our prayers. Now, he could have commented on anything else within the prayer, or he could have just done what we're doing through this series and given an entire commentary on the entire Lord's Prayer itself. But this is what he zeroed in on. And it only makes sense, though, right? If we know who Jesus is, we know this makes total sense, that he would zero in on this idea of forgiveness because he came as a sacrifice of atonement. He came to die so that we might be forgiven of our sins. And it only makes sense that we would forgive one another as well. Finally, it's revealed that if we do not forgive others of their sins, God our Father will not forgive us of ours either. Wow. What a litmus test for Christians, for those who say they believe. If you fail to forgive others of their sins, you've got to start asking yourself, am I really a believer? Am I really saved? Am I really following after God? Have I really placed my trust and hope in Jesus Christ? I think of the line from Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But if you don't forgive others who have wronged you, I would recommend the emphasis on the fear and trembling part. God says you cannot expect him to forgive your sins if you do not forgive others of theirs. So let's wrap this up. I am delighted by the reality that God, through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, did not give us a clear answer 
Remember how I said, once and for all, we're done with this topic. We've solved it. But God, through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, did not give us a clear answer to a word that we should use in this portion of the Lord's Prayer. Instead, what he has given us, even more importantly, is a principle to live by. Forgive others as our Father in heaven forgives us. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this principle that we are to forgive other people. And Lord, not just arbitrarily, wantonly, whatever, not just because you tell us to forgive each other, but Lord, because you forgive us. Because we have a great debt that we cannot possibly pay, and you've paid it for us through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And because of that, we are alleviated of the burden of our debt of sin. And it only makes sense if we are forgiven of so much, it should be easy for us to forgive so little in terms of the offense other people commit against us. Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit works on our hearts. Help us, Lord. Uh, Helps us to be able to be reconciled to other people, to be able to forgive other people, Lord, as we know uh, that it can be a struggle sometimes, uh, just as we've all been through different things. But Father God, we thank you, Lord, that this command, that this is part of uh, your model prayer for us. And may it guide us and teach us and lead us as we live our lives and relate to other people. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen.